Hi everybody, uh, Julian Hayes here from uh, Veneto Privacy. Very welcome to the webinar today on Privacy by Design, uh, hosted by uh, UB Secure and Veneto Privacy. Okay, so I think we will start off. Uh, again, very welcome to everyone. Um, we're joining you from, from Helsinki in, in Finland and uh, in Venice in, in Italy. So uh, hope the weather is good where you are. Uh, my name is Julian Hayes, as I mentioned. So I'm Managing Director of uh, Veneto Privacy. Uh, Keith and myself will just do a quick introduction for, from our companies. And, um, and at the end of the session, we'll also have a, a Q&A. So uh, feel free to ask any difficult questions that you may have. Um, we'd be more than happy to hear them. Keith, I'll let you do a quick introduction for yourself there, and uh, we can then get started on the presentation. All right, thanks, thanks, Julian. So, hi everybody. My name is Keith Huber, and I'm the Vice President of Customer Success at Ubi Secure. At Ubi Secure, that means I'm in charge of the sales engineering team, which is a, a team of product experts who help our, our customers and partners to choose, implement, and, uh, and maintain our, our software. So Ubi Secure is a leading provider of identity and access management systems, which are specialized in the customer and uh, external user area. So these are all of your either end, end consumer users, your partners, your supply chain, people outside of your, your own organization. And we do this uh, at scale for, for large businesses and, and government entities such as post office, um, large uh, retail chains, as well as uh, dozens and dozens of uh, commercial services offering uh, customer customer facing online services. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Great. So um, as, uh, as Keith said, so essentially UB Secure are a, uh, a, a specialist identity management uh, services provider and Veneto Privacy are a uh, data protection uh, services uh, consultancy. So we specialize in uh, data protection officer services, but also the, uh, the, uh, all, the, all the bells and whistles that are required for compliance. So not just GDPR, but also across the other suite of, uh, of regulatory obligations across the world. So, um, so we're gonna keep today's session quite informal, right? So uh, we will have a, a session at the end and we'll also be joined by uh, Jesse, um, who's with uh, UB Secure also. So um, we're going to talk about some real world examples of privacy by design, but also some of the core concepts and tools in terms of achieving that. So I'll kick off uh, myself with my own pieces. Great. So um, yeah, so effective examples of privacy design around the world. So I think, uh, you know, with, with new uh, challenges in the working environment presented by the global pandemic, um, data privacy and security has become a, become a key uh, talking point when it comes to um, the challenges that, that are posed for, for individuals. Um, so whether it's working from home or uh, contact tracing apps or uh, cyber breaches, the, the, the challenges are endless. So privacy and security are really front of mind for organizations. Um, and we'll talk about one or two solutions that we've worked on um, and how we implemented those and how we can kind of uh, assimilate those uh, types of solutions depending on your working uh, your working environment. So, I know that people are across a different uh, sector of uh, of uh, 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 industry. So, you know, we've got telecommunications, we've got public service, and we've got IT solutions providers. So, there's, there's quite a lot, which is um, you know, in terms of the the audience that we have, which is which is fantastic. So, great. So, just in terms of strategies and real world examples um, and what is essentially the how do we define privacy by design so some of the aspects you know if, if you think that it's there's core principles for establishing effort and, uh, and uh, you know definitive thinking in terms of how you're going to ex execute um, your solution or your process. So it, it, it is very much preventative and not a remedial action. Uh, privacy is the default. So I guess, uh, you know, a lot of companies are, are looking to, you know, take advantage of as much information as possible when it comes to the type of information capture that they want to get, um, you know, perhaps are not the basis of what they really need. 
So I think, you know, from a, from a transparency perspective, having privacy as the default uh, setting is, is a good way to start out. Um, and also like having it very much embedded into the core process. And we'll talk about it a little bit along the way as well, just because you're, you're taking these actions and being, you know, very much uh, uh, of the view that you're taking privacy seriously, it's also important that you kind of document those discussions that you had internally or externally with third party stakeholders um, as to, you know, why you went about, uh, you know, making changes to make sure that it's, it's privacy friendly uh, and security friendly. So documentation of, of that thought process and steps that were taken can be key in um, you know, regulatory investigations or internal audit purposes that it, you, you do have a cultural, um, you know, viewpoint towards uh, privacy um, and that's, that's the, the, the methodology that you're following. So a positive sum, so again, it, it shouldn't necessarily be a, be a negotiation that is, you know, weighted in control of the organization when you're, when you're capturing information. So there shouldn't be unnecessary trade-offs um, in terms of the information that you're gathering uh, on individuals as a part of a product or process. So, um, you know, a good way to do that is to, you know, uh, do an assessment as to, well, you know, what is exactly necessary for us to be able to provide this service or what information do we absolutely need to be able to uh, effectively, uh, you know, uh, utilize this information. So end-to-end -end security, so it's a key subject at the moment, obviously. Um, the, the whole data life cycle, and we'll talk a bit about you know, some of the control measures that we can do uh, to help implement that. But you know, overall, the whole data flow from the initial capture to the um, end state that needs to be uh, treated you know, with a security um, consideration as relevant to the risk. So you know, perhaps uh, your first name is not readily identifiable. Um, alone, but it could be with other information. So, um, with health data or other, you know, sensitive um, information like political views or sexual orientation, they obviously have greater ramifications for uh, individuals if they were to be compromised. Um, so, so you know, they really kind of roll roll into each other. These these uh, high, uh, types of um, uh, thought processes that we approach when we're embedding privacy by design. So digital resilience. So uh, I'm not too sure about you guys, but um, you know, across the world, we've seen a wave of cyber attacks and, uh, and outages and disruptions to uh, services from uh, mostly on the part of, of bad actors or malicious attacks. So whether it's a ransomware um, or it's a you know a Bitcoin uh, uh, demand for release of information or unencryption of data. Um, which has been exported from the organization, there needs to be, you know, a, a considerable focus and effort on, you know, what are our recovery operations when it comes to uh, the information that we capture. So, you know, when I talk to my customers about um, compliance and backups and uh, business, business continuity, data integrity, you know, I, I don't need to cite, uh, you know, punitive measures that are financial um, albeit, you know, uh, it, that's obviously a, a key consideration, but, you know, a lot of people are, you know, talking about 4% of our global turnover or 2% of our global turnover for GDPR fines, but in the immediate term, even if there is no uh, regulatory action on the part of a, of a data protection authority, there is the cost to your business and being able to, to maintain your business and, and process your customer's data. So if, if that is compromised in any way, um, that it can have uh, serious uh, ramifications for, for your business and it could effectively put you put you out of business for a period. So, you know, so I think that's that's really key to, to remember that, yeah, especially when you're dealing with, you know, non privacy or security believers, when it comes to privacy by design, that you're saying, look, it's a business capability to maintain, change and recover um, technology uh, dependent business. So that, that's what we're really looking at here. Um, and you know, depending on the size of the organization, they might decide to invest, uh, you know, disparate amounts as to uh, what they want to do to be able to maintain that. So it, perhaps it's just a, a backup drive of all the information that the company has that's kept off site. Perhaps it's something much more 
uh, robust and, uh, and technolog technologically advanced. Great, so who, who are the players? So I, I know um, there's probably a few information security people you know, who have that same challenge that look, it's not the security team's duties to perform security all the time, and it's not the, the legal team's uh, duty to implement privacy all the time. So it's definitely a, a team player uh, approach. Like, so um, in any uh, you know, uh, well-embedded privacy by design, um, uh, delivery of a project, you will have, you know, uh, every player basically, uh, whether it's the marketing team, the security team, uh, the corporate security function, the, the customer services function, they'll need to play a part into providing uh, inputs into those key pillars, whether it's security, transparency, um, and maintaining individual users' rights, they need to be at the table and, uh, and playing their part in that. That also goes for suppliers uh, and senior management. So, you know, usually senior management get involved when something has gone wrong um, and that there's a, if there's a data breach or there's a, there's a delay in a product release because of a marketing or privacy concern. So having those people in the room or in, in the, the Zoom conference or Teams conference at the earliest stage is absolutely key um, to be able to uh, maintain that uh, you know integral ap approach when it comes to project delivery. So um, companies use different uh, approaches to project management, but the the key inputs are the same when it comes to what those mitigating factors are, and again documenting what the steps that you took. So it's as important as getting budget for the project itself. Uh, privacy needs to be uh, a checkpoint across um, how you will. Uh, control what changes or aspects that you need to deliver for the product or service. Um, and it's increasingly, it's also a thing for sales teams. So um, if any of you are working in the sales function or, you know, no doubt you're supporting the sales function, um, that's a key question there that, that uh, customers are asking as well. Okay, well, what about privacy? What about security? Um, and having this type of uh, methodology and approach in terms of how you deliver projects and processes Will, will definitely help with that. So, um, and, and you know, I, I have my own customers who, you know, they have products and services um, and now the wake of COVID-19, they're getting demands from their uh, enterprise customers around uh, data processing agreements and liabilities and, you know, where is our data stored? Is the data stored in the US? So this, it's key that all these things are, are uh, form a part of your approach from a privacy by design perspective so we can satisfy uh, internal and extent, external stakeholders. Okay, so we've done that probably just in twice. <clears throat> so yes, just some examples from other sectors. So, um, you know, it, I had, used to have an old boss and he was like, you know, what's the checklist? What's the pilot's checklist? I think it's an excellent um, way to uh, consider how you would, uh, you know, risk manage a product or service, or you know, perhaps you have a legal obligation to implement a process um, that requires data collection that you, you don't have at, at the moment. So, uh, and we'll talk about an example later on. But you know, all flights have the same um, takeoff and landing procedures that are followed and documented and defined. Uh, from uh, from from every origination to termination of the flight. So, going through those those same checkpoints should be the same for from the privacy perspective that you're you're, you're thinking about it and you're consulting each other uh, on the basis of the data uh, that's being processed. Um, yeah. So, so life cycle security measures. So the same approach can be used can, is controlled and repeatable and produces. Uh, uh, mi uh, procedures for minim minimizing risk. So that's the, the whole end to end. So from data collection, you know, is there endpoint security on the website? Um, is there, if it's paper based, you know, who has access to the, the, the copy within a retail store or whatever it may be? Is it scanned? Is it stored on a local drive in the, in the, uh, in the local retail unit before it's received to head office? So these are the types of, uh, of questions that we need to ask ourselves from an end to end perspective. And then also on those control principles. So, you know, notice and transparency is, is a key kind of pillar uh, under data protection law throughout the world. So it's, it's not necessarily a European or GDPR uh, type of obligation. 
So you're effectively ensuring that you're stating what information you're collecting um, as a part of a product or service. Um, and you're uh, ensuring that, that it's made clear to the users that, that this is the information that is captured, this is what we're going to do with it. Um, and you know, usually that's, not, that's kind of a non-negotiable, right? So it's a statement of fact. So you're signing up to my um, Telia telecommunication service or you're, uh, you know, you're signing up to a Western Union money transfer service. There are conditions that are non-negotiable in terms of how the service will work. And then there are uh, uh, obligations from an individual rights perspective that as a data controller, uh, an organization who's responsible for processing the data that you'll need to fulfill. So stating those uh, in, a, in a transparent and easy way is, is key. And that goes also for you know, uh, apps and services or cookie website, cookies on websites. Um, it might be minimal data collection, but it should be you know, easy to understand and, um, and not spook the, the data subject or the customer into what information is being uh, processed. Security treatment again, so you know it's really important that we, we understand how we're going to process data and, and what type of conditions are we going to impose upon that. And, and that really goes across some of the uh, you know the, the, the further down the field processing that will happen on that particular data asset. So we might be um, you know collecting a telephone number for a specific reason, um, and the you know, we might have other obligations to store that. So perhaps it's for law enforcement or for, ta for tax authorities. So documenting what those are and where they've been copied to is also important and what the security controls are around that data. So retention and masking and, uh, you know, data life cycle, uh, you know, it's, it's really important to, to understand how long we're legally kept or how, how long we'd like to store the data. And, um, but also there's some privacy enhancing techniques that people talk about um, in terms of, you know, the, what can we mask? What are the, the mechanisms for masking? Um, you know, does customer service have a, a greater visibility over um, particular data types versus another de department? On the contractual arrangements as well, so really important for third parties, you know, the, a lot of contracts that I've worked on, they're highlighting, you know, uh, the organization implementation of privacy by design within their, their own uh, organizations who are processors of third party data. So that's really important and that we understand, you know, what the data processor who you've contracted is uh, required to do. Um, and are they reflective of your security approach within your organization? On our transfers internally and externally, I guess we talked a bit about that, right? So again, so the same data might have more value to one part of the organization, more organization than the other. Um, and also when we're transferring internationally, what are the contractual arrangements and security arrangements for, uh, for that in terms of ensuring that the data is, is maintained. So a uh, big discussion at the moment around trends too, and uh, the, the investigations in Germany are now kicked off on uh, data being stored, uh, European data being stored in the US and the legality of that. From a, from a contract law perspective. So uh, interesting times ahead. So yeah, I look, the, 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 the surface of privacy by design in terms of data collection points um, from, from a front end perspective, whether it's a website, it's an app, uh, perhaps it's facial recognition type of uh, technology, the, the, the same principles apply in terms of data collection. So control measures to be, to be able to prevent uh, you know, malpractice or uh, inadvertent data collection could be predefined fields or locking down fields to limit uh, data collection as to what's necessary. Um, and again, you know, maintaining what's relevant and necessary for the to, for the product to be able to um, to be able to function and making sure that you have a, a legal basis. So, um, for any lawyers on the call, so obviously if you're if you're relying on a legitimate interest to collect the data, um, then you need to sometimes conduct a balancing assessment to make sure that the user's rights are, um, you know, upheld in, in terms of how the processing is undertaken. Backend, obviously, uh, if you're if you're a full stack developer or you're looking after a large complex uh, IT organization, then you know you've got a, a, 
a, a labyrinth of information processes and APIs in terms of how the data flows. So it's really key to kind of tag each data asset, which I'll have a slide on a bit better a little later. Um, in terms of the asset type, you know, so what is the, what is the data type being processed? Where is it in pro being processed? What's the security treatment of that data? Is it is it uh, you know raw text? Is it encrypted? Is it masked? And the onward uh, processing of that data, uh, and then obviously the business continuity and failover which you would depend upon if there was a compromise to that system. So that's, that's kind of a shortcut to uh, at least getting a bare bones to your back end to, to try and turn the lights on in terms of what you're doing and what you would do if there was a compromise to the information. Great, yeah, I won't dwell on this too much. So just some of those controls then from the back end perspective, you know, I think data masking is key in terms of, you know, uh, limiting certainly in, in some scenarios that I've worked in. So I, I was in the Caribbean for, for a, a month working in a telecommunications provider out there. Um, and even in the, the call center, the, the staff are not allowed to have pens and paper. So that was a control that was uh, put in place uh, because there was a risk of data being copied from CRM systems. So. So like on an even greater scale, then they say, okay, well, how can we limit that? Can we, can we mask information before it even you know, reaches the call center? And, and what do they actually need to, do, need to know uh, in terms of what, what information is being presented for a customer? So, so there are solutions out there in terms of logical access, masking um, and, uh, and encryption to, to ensure the data integrity. So there's always a different purposes for processing the data. And um, so it'll be dependent on the, the type of security risk that is, that is posed to, to that data. And then also obviously internally and externally as to the value of the information that is being processed. So again, just a, an example there, this is a, a short inventory uh, for data assets, uh, you know, uh, labeling for for, uh, it's like a mini Article 30 register for those who know their GDPR. So you've got your, your data category, uh, why you're processing it, how long you're processing it for, and then further processing uh, within systems, perhaps internally or externally, um, so that you can have a, a good understanding of, of what's going on. Great, so this is, a, this is a real world example. I won't say who it's from, but uh, I don't know if any of you have got a COVID-19 uh, status request from your employers or from uh, other, other authorities, but uh, essentially this is a, uh, a snapshot, which I made up um, of a COVID-19 vaccination record for a, uh, a, a company who, who has a, a duty to, to understand the vaccination status of their work, workplace. Um, but uh, as you can see here, like the, the, there's a real challenge here in terms of the information that's been captured. So again, from a data minimization uh, perspective, the you know, blood type or other illness uh, perhaps would be not relevant to, uh, to the, the, the issue at hand, which is to understand the, the employee's vaccination status. So. Um, so I think also another challenge there is the, the instruction to upload the record onto the, the HR folder, uh, the HR server rather, and um, find your folder, which would kind of indicate that there are other folders available. <laughs> so it could be a major challenge um, for uh, individuals if they could, uh, you know, potentially see the, the vaccination status of uh, other employees of the business, but it also it's it's a broader indication that there is an availability to search other employees' information. So again, that's a poor design, poor execution, and uh, no real legal basis for for requesting it. So um, that's just a just just one real world example, which we got sorted out by the way. <laughs> Great. So yeah, I think just compar comparable control procedures. So ju just on the you know the checklist. So like it's it's like getting in the car. It's like starting your aircraft. You get in. You check your mirrors. You put your seatbelt on. You turn on your lights if it's dark. You know, follow a, a predefined set of procedures. 
um, which we'll, we'll be sharing the deck obviously uh, after the call. Um, but there, follow the procedures that you would uh, reasonably expect to take from a privacy by design perspective to, to satisfy the nature of the data collection, how transparent you are, what controls you have from a security perspective of the data, how you're ensuring that the individuals have uh, you know, been informed of their rights over the data processing, um, and then uh, obviously detailing uh, ongoing processes that the, the data uh, may be subject to. Okay, just on another discussion point, so we'll, we'll talk a bit about it with Keith as well, but um, I worked on a number of portability project um, for the telecommunications sector. Um, and the, the challenge was essentially to implement a, a multi-carrier central database for number of portability so that um, customers could move their telephone number from one operator to another. So um, it, it's basically to satisfy a different regulatory obligation other than privacy. But we had to think about, well, what, what would the challenges be from a privacy perspective in sharing um, telephone numbers between operators and, and potentially customer IDs, etc. Um, so the the solution is obviously compact, complex in terms of that operators need to be able to talk to each other to validate that numbers are 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 uh, being exchanged from one operator to another, and the added complication that um, even operators who were not involved between two carriers who are reporting a number they needed to be informed of the subscriber's move uh, for call routing purposes. So, um, so it was a totally new and unique um, uh, implementation from an IT perspective. Uh, a lot of uh, mediation uh, zones required between the networks, um, but it, it was, uh, there was two basically solution designs that were on the table. And the first one, um, you know, th this isn't a, a, a schematic of the actual uh, architecture, but it gives you an idea of how complicated it could be um, from a uh, you know from a privacy perspective. So the, the initial solution was that uh, the customer ID would be uh, requested in the standard uh, provision process that you get even if you're connecting a new customer, and we'd store that data in a central database uh, just in case the customer decides to to move the number to another operator or to port their number. So that would be your name, your address, your your ID. Um, your your subscriber number, obviously, and your your uh, customer account number, and that will be stored in the central server. And then, when you wanted to port the number, you'd inform the new operator, and that they would commence the uh, the migration process. So you know, there's big challenges with with that, right? So, and it, it does have kind of uh, comparable challenges as we had with the um, you know uh, data retention directive, which was. Um, uh, prescribed by the European Union to, to store customer information uh, if um, the, the police or the uh, law enforcement authorities wanted to get a copy of it. So uh, who you called, when you called them, etc. And that was kind of really on the premise that th there might be a chance that you'll commit a crime sometime in the future um, and we need to know who you called and, and who's called you. So, so a, bit of a bit of a challenge from a privacy perspective. Um, uh, but it, again, it, this is pretty much the similar type thing, not, not, for, not for the purposes of, of law, for, law enforcement assistance, but definitely um, you know, a mass, uh, mass storage of uh, customer information, uh, just in case the, the number decided to port. So we changed the approach completely on that. Um, we essentially decided that, okay, well, we should have a central database, that's for sure. Um, and, you know, we, we understand that the reasons uh, and basis behind that, but we basically have a, a centralized record so that the number ID only, and it was only transmitted to the database on the basis that it actually was requesting to port. So we developed a common language so that the operators would be able to talk to each other. So, the, you know, the, this, uh, this customer is with Vodafone, they're going to Orange or whoever it may be, and the centralized database would take a copy of that. And it was basically, it, it developed a capability that it was available even offline. So if the central database wants to go offline, the operator was not dependent on it. So, the, so perhaps they couldn't port any more numbers, but the handover of, uh, of you know, one subscriber number from one operator to another 
was done irrespective, um, you know, even, you know, irrespective of the database status, right? So that was the situation, so. And there were some other spin-off benefits, right? So obviously there's a, there's a resilience aspect in that as we talked about, you know, what's the, the, the integrity of this information? So because the central database was not required for um, to be operational 24 seven, at least if there was an outage, we knew that the numbers that had already ported would not be impacted, but there may be an outage preventing new numbers from being ported. But that was a common uh, SLA that was agreed with all the operators that, you know, should this happen, we, we agree the downtime uh, in advance and, uh, you know, rectifications would be made. And then all the other operators, so as I said, you needed to be able to operate even, uh, sorry, inform operators who weren't involved in the initial port request. So after the port was completed, the, uh, the central database would update all operators as to the uh, situation of, of a number. So, you know, this number has gone from T-Mobile uh, to Verizon, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so yeah, I think selling compliance. So you know, it's obviously compliance is not always the the, friend, the friend, friendliest uh, of bedfellows with marketing. But I think you know, I, I think it's uh, it's important that we really outline the value and also the non-punitive measures that are um, you know that are that are uh, possible. Uh, in the event of a data breach, or even even the, the whim of an investigation from a regulator, it can be extremely disruptive uh, for organizations. So um, uh, we'll talk a bit a little bit la later with Keith. But there was a, a marketing agency um, in Ireland who uh, you know, were, were assigning club card points to uh, you know you do your grocery shopping and you get your uh, you, you accumulate points over time, um, and you would. Uh, you know, buy whatever it may be holidays or discounts or coupons uh, from from your supermarket. But this company was that was providing the solution to uh, to all of the supermarkets essentially got subject to a, a ransomware attack, and data was compromised. And the Data Protection Authority essentially found that the you know the situational uh, the situation from a security perspective was uh, far from. Um, uh, uh, green in terms of how they'd implemented. So they ceased, they ordered them to cease processing. So that is basically an instruction to stop data processing regardless um, of the investigation and while the investigation is ongoing. Um, so that can have, you know, that, that can essentially put your, your business to an end. So I know we have uh, some TCS uh, people on the call as well. So I think that's something as well that, that your customers would be mindful of and maybe you know, perhaps in the conversations that you're having with them uh, as to the importance of, you know, privacy by design as a mitigation factor, um, you know, and, and following the steps so that, you know, that this, this is just a, a solution that can help, uh, you know, uh, help in a situation where you're effectively told to stop, stop your business. Okay. So Keith, these are these are your slides. So uh, I can drive the slides for you if you want to take it away, or uh, how would you like to do it? Uh, yeah, happy with that. If you if you move the slides, um, thanks very much for your, for your, for your presentation, Jules. Uh, I want to talk uh, particularly about how our customers uh, approach data privacy using the tool that the user sees when they first first come to a website. Normally, they're they're either registering for for uh, access to a website. Or they're they're logging into a website. And modern web applications are nowadays made up of many different components running in different places. So you have on-premise applications that your IT department codes itself. You might have cloud services that uh, you buy as a service and you you integrate. You might have um, mobile devices and mobile apps. And the keeping track of all of that where your where your user data is is is, is very complicated, as uh, as Jules mentioned. So in, in these scenarios, uh, a lot of people have standardized on a, on a single sign-on system, a system that instead of integrating uh, or having a username and password or an authentication method for each individual component, that you have a centralized system, you have one secure place to, to store your, your, your data and your, your user information, one process for creating an account and managing an account, and, and then share the, the login information across those services. And doing this is a is a real 
uh, time saver and uh, stress saver in, in trying to uh, reduce your, your spray of uh, user information across the IT system. So these, uh, these platforms, such as the ones that Secure provides, they are based on uh, standard uh, best practices uh, and, and international standards. And the most uh, basic things they, they provide is the encryption and decryption of, of user data. And when data is provided, it's also provided as it's being assigned, assigned data. So you can validate and verify that the, the data is from the, the trusted source and it hasn't been changed on the way. So this not only applies, this is at the message level. So uh, of course the, the data itself uh, is being transmitted over, over secure channels, uh, typically in, in the browser. Um, but th those messages are also individually uh, encrypted and, and signed. So that's a real uh, easy way at the system level that the, the system could take care of that for you. The encryption technology changes over time. So uh, it's really important that that's uh, extensible, that it can be changed depending on um, as legislation changes or as uh, the, the networks that you're, you're sharing information with, that they tighten their, their encryption requirements. Uh, if that's done in an extensible manner, that's, that's really important. Um, these, are, these are things which are, are built into this type of uh, software. Most importantly, you, you don't want to give information to every system if they don't need it. So you follow the, the minimum disclosure principle of, of sending information only to applications on a, on a need to know basis. And that can be as simple as just masking, masking attributes, not, not sending attributes to a, to a user, changing attributes so that instead of sending the raw value that you send uh, some aggregated part of the value, for example, is somebody over 18 or yes or no, rather than sending their date of birth or sending uh, the same information in, in a hashed or encrypted format so that either you don't have to send the original value but you can still um, fulfill a use case. Um, uh, identity system typically includes uh, the ability to generate what's called a transistor, uh, transient or, or persistent identifier. And these are two ways to, instead of using the actual username when you're trying to communicate things about a user, that you are using a, a synonymous reference to that, uh, that user. So a transient uh, identifier is, means that uh, it changes every time you log into the system. So you might not be able to tell that this is the same user as the, the user who logged in yesterday. Some parts of your system may not need to know. They just need to know that you're an authorized user, you're allowed to access something, and it might require no personalization. The other one is called a persistent identifier. And this means if you log into the system yesterday and you log in today, we might tell part of the system that this is the same user as just yesterday, but not share any other attributes about the user. And for many use cases, that's, that's enough to be able to allow that part of an application to continue um, and provide state for, for that application without the application actually getting any uh, personal attributes. You have to be aware that those are in, in many cases identifiable, personally identifiable information because they can, can link to an individual user when combined with other, other information. But for the target service receiving them, they, they have no other context about the user. Um, Jules talked about, Julian talked about uh, the basis for processing and, and one of the basis for processing is consent um, uh, in the identity management systems. Typically you want to present that information when you're collecting the data or also when you're releasing the data either to internal parts of the system or to, to external third parties and the, the login screen or the, the, the user, user information screen are, are typical points where you allow that, that consent to be collected and managed and then revoked when, when necessary. If you go further on the slide, um, the other one is about uh, account mapping that um, uh, nowadays it's quite common to allow you to link uh, account information from third party services such as your social network or your, your work address or what's called a federated account where you sign in, for example, using your LinkedIn account and you link that to an existing account that you already have. And uh, when we do that, it's possible to do that uh, using the most minimum amount of information without uh, bringing, um, without requesting too much information from that service provider, but having enough information to link the account that you use, for example, a, a LinkedIn account or a Facebook account 
as a, as a, as a way to, to find the end user's account without actually requesting any of the information that's stored in that other, other service. And when we're logging everything, uh, we talked about the logging and data retention that it's important to log just the things that are, are relevant for, uh, for the task at hand. Uh, we have the capabilities, for example, to remove sensitive attributes such as social security numbers, which might be used in some identity services or, or completely mask uh, the user information. So our own services provide endpoints, for example, that allow billing information to be uh, calculated, uh, but it's actually impossible to determine uh, the individual user from that, from that billing endpoint. And another simple one is the username and account policies or password policies. Uh, many times today, services force you to use an email address, which actually exposes a lot of information about yourself. Um, services could consider allowing uh, the, the user themselves to, to, to choose an ID or not having to have an ID by, by linking to third party services. Um, that becomes uh, an issue when there's multiple data breaches and your, your, your email address is, is leaked from multiple services, especially where a user is, is reusing, reusing passwords, it's a real threat to the, to the end user. So these, these things all occur during the, during the, the login, during the, the single sign-on process, and they're, they're really good points to uh, collect, verify, and show the information to the user. For IT teams who are building systems, that's a uh, real challenge because if you're not familiar with security principles, or even if you are secure, familiar with security and privacy principles, it's really easy to get wrong. Even if you pick good tools, follow good practice, it, it's frightfully easy, easy to get wrong. So by, by choosing a, a ready package, something that's already, already made for that purpose, it's not made by accident, it's made by a dedicated team who focus just on, on that security and privacy. Choosing a product which is based on, on industry standards, so standards that have been reviewed, peer reviewed, um, developed uh, across many different industries, many different uh, jurisdictions that uh, are, are capable of the, the use cases for, for privacy protection. Um, by having a product which can be easily reconfigured uh, without having to, to code things uh, also means that your time to market or your time to implement changes is, is much faster. You don't have to start a development project, uh, specify everything. It's more a feature of, or a factor of uh, reconfiguring what you, what you already have, to, for example, to meet uh, tighter regulations in, uh, in the market. Of course, with any, any software, software uh, decays over time. Uh, vulnerabilities are found uh, and so on. So it's important that the, the software that you use is continuously up, up, updated, not only by the, the, the issuer of the software, but then that uh, update is performed either in, in your instance of, of a cloud service or in your on-premise installation. So it's really important to, to keep, keep that in mind. And then uh, by having a, uh, selecting a, a ready-made package to do that, it's already been subject to quite in-depth uh, testing, not only during the development process, but uh, during the release process, uh, both in, internal testing, testing against uh, third-party testing tools, uh, against the industry standard uh, testing tools. And then all of the other customers who sh share that same software also go through their own uh, system deployment and, and system audits, security audits. So it's, a, it's another benefit of, of choosing a, a package to do that. If we look at the life cycle on the next slide, um, in the, the, the end user life cycle, there's the sort of main points of uh, when you collect the information, you want to be able to have transparency to show the user uh, why you're collecting the information, what the benefit for the user is, and how you're going to process that information. I think that this uh, legal notice is, is important. And also important when sharing information, for example, outside your own organization. And to do that at, at the relevant and, and timely times when uh, when the user is ready to understand and is ready to get more information so before the event happens generally uh, verification is, is important uh, in, in most jurisdictions the end user has uh, a legal right to, to check their own information to perform corrections and, uh, and review that that should be as easy to do as, as uh, signing up for an account you should be able to do that online and then uh, termination at the end of a, of a user's relationship with the company that they should be able to have 
an easy way to, to terminate their account either temporarily or, or completely and have a full understanding of how their data or the, the remnants of their data are, are going to be handled once they once they leave. Julian uh, spoke about some of these and, and a lot of these are also covered by, by uh, quite clear legislation. When you're doing an IT project, especially, uh, for example, introducing a new service or, or upgrading or replacing an existing service, you, you have to take these uh, checkpoints into, into play. So by privacy design, it means planning, planning and, and carefully thinking about everything beforehand, not only from the the functionality perspective, but the, the privacy perspective, the security perspective, having uh, internal reviews and uh, both external reviews, not only for your, your own team, but the, the wider your organization and, and the customers as a, as a whole. Um, uh, I find it's quite common for organizations not to understand the tools that they already have, not to understand how to configure those. So it's really important to, to seek expert advice, um, both from uh, the, the systems that they're working with, but uh, also understanding the, 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 the legal ramifications of, of choices in configuration. Very simple things that uh, are often missed is updating on-screen text and links to, uh, to match changes in the system. You might be storing a new attribute or, or having a release of information to third parties. It's really important to go through and update, update those things. They're, they're very simple configuration things which are, which are often missed, which can put you at risk. And then, uh, of course, that uh, logging and data retention. Um, the systems and, and all of the applications behind them, they, they generate typically lots of data and you, you need to consider very carefully what actual data you need to, you need to keep on hand and, and how to store that securely, not to put your, your customers at risk. And that's a continual process. It doesn't stop when the system goes live. It, it should be uh, followed up with regular reviews. So in, in summary for, for my section, um, in terms of introducing and managing users' attributes and the, the information about the users, often that's done inside an identity management and, and single sign-on system. And by, by standardizing on one platform across your, across your enterprise, you ease, ease the process of not only inventory of those, those attributes, uh, where, the, where that information is spread, but you give yourself much more clarity and control about uh, how it's stored and how it's passed on to third parties. Great. Very good. Thank you, Keith. That's, that's really good. I think that's a, definitely a good, good showcase of the, the, the definitive security steps that we can take um, in terms of securing data. Um, and, and I think it's really important for everyone to understand, you know, you need to invest in the security relevant to the risk uh, of, of a compromise. So um, there's obviously, you know, serious consideration that is needed for um, how you would, uh, you know, get buy-in or, you know, how it'll impact the user flow from a data perspective. So, but it's, it, it's really critical that, that at least that, you know, consideration is given as to, well, you know, what, what's, the, what's the issue if we can't collect this or, how important from the security perspective is we need to, to implement that. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of shortcuts there. It, it's not rocket science in terms of how you would do it. Um, so, and, uh, you know, as any data protection people will tell you, you know, if we don't have it, then we can't, we can't lose it, you know? So um, doing that impact assessment as to what's needed and how we're gonna process it, it, it will be, uh, will be, you know, 50% of the way towards uh, getting a good privacy by design um, perspective. So that, that's kind of, a, that's our, our uh, presentation element over. Um, we we're gonna chat a bit about, um, you know, other real world examples. So I, I know um, uh, UB Secure and myself, we've, uh, we've worked uh, on a piece on, you know, contact tracing apps in, in, the, in the wake of COVID-19, so obviously, you know, if we look at if we look at the mobile phone as, as a key tool in fighting the pandemic, um, I'm sure many of you in your own countries have uh, some sort of uh, contact tracing app or, or COVID-19 uh, notification app. Um, and it really has kind of been built uh, on the basis of the, the breakdown of the partition between the, the mobile device and the other sensors um, and APIs that the app 
uh, has from, from a mobile phone perspective. So, um, you know, so we've seen obviously there's the basic, you know, the, the basic public health notification process in terms of informing you of, you know, wash your hands, wear a mask, maintain social distancing, etc. But there are other components of, of the mobile phone, whether it's your, your Wi-Fi, um, whether it's the Bluetooth connectivity, which are kind of being leveraged um, and being uh, used to be able to communicate with other devices in order to, to uh, you know, maintain your safety. So, <clears throat> you know, obviously there's a, there's a public health background in terms of how, why that information is being used, but the, the user journey from a customer experience perspective and uh, in, informing users that you're doing this uh, remains uh, the same, right? So uh, all of those services would have gone through um, a data protection impact assessment or a privacy assessment, depending on what, what, what type of the world you're, you're in, um, that would uh, basically perform an analysis of what information is being collected and how, and, uh, and how we're going to process it. So I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a real uh, uh, challenge uh, fr from a, uh, you know, public policy perspective of the use of these services, but they're, they're definitely, um, you know, they're, they're playing their part in, in fighting the pandemic. And the you know the same control principles as to um, you know you know well how how creepy is it that we're able to do this um, and providing some sort of uh, uh, legal assessment or, or even engineering assessment of how it would work is is key. So we, we open the floor to to any questions. Um, we have uh, we have engineers and we have uh, legal professionals and privacy professionals on the call. So we, we'd welcome any any. Uh, 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 questions that we have in terms of the examples that we've outlined or anything else that we haven't uh, covered in the presentation. So I I'll open the floor, uh, Jesse or, or Keith, I don't know if you want to kick off with a question, um, uh, particularly around uh, what you've seen in, in terms of implementation from, uh, from a GDPR perspective or, or an e-privacy or relevant regulation. Um, and, uh, and if you wanted to talk a bit, a bit about that or pose any questions to me, but uh, I think, as we've mentioned before, that you know, getting away from from legal assessments is key from a privacy by design perspective. It needs to be kind of everyone's day job. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll open the floor for any questions that anyone has. Thank you. I could I could start here as the data protection officer at UB Secure. The key take from my perspective today is that privacy by design must continue throughout the product lifespan. And privacy by design as demanded by the GDPR is one of those very, very few things that actually have a reverse burden of proof in any Western democracy. So the data controller must be able to show that they have taken privacy into account throughout the product or service lifespan. It doesn't end when the coding ends. And in addition, one view I'd like to share with you all is that you probably all heard the industry analysts repeat for several years now how data is the new oil or even how data is the new gold. But if data is gold, then it definitely should be secured appropriately, not just left lying around on a street for any random passerby to pick up or any open AVS instance, for example. And finally, when it comes to privacy, don't just prepare for today, but instead prepare for the future. And for one practical example, we will definitely see massive changes in both encryption and related legislation once quantum computers take hold. And that might be sooner than any of us can predict. So thank you. That's an excellent point, Jesse. Absolutely. Um, as, a, as a data protection officer myself, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm definitely aligned with, with your thinking there. It, it's not just for project delivery, it's for a life cycle of the whole process. So, um, so you know, one of the tools that Jesse and myself would be familiar with is the data protection impact assessment. And, and they basically don't end, right? So you can perform a data protection impact assessment on a product or process. But essentially, you are you are required to maintain a record of that DPIA, and if the the nature of the processing changes over time, then you are obliged to conduct a new review. 
So, um, and some of the failings that I've seen from, from a, a regulatory perspective is that, you know, companies just don't do this or they don't document what they're doing within the organization. So that remains a key challenge. Do we have any other questions from other participants? We're, we're nearly up to the hour, so I'm sure people have meetings to go to. Please feel free to, to jump in. Okay, great. I don't think there's anyone else, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate your time joining, joining us today. Uh, we will make the webinar available uh, as a recording. Um, and we'll communicate with you. Our contact details are here if you need any further tips or guidance or you want to provide any feedback on the presentation and uh, the presenters. But thank you very much for everyone for attending today and hope you're staying safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.